So one option is just for me to give up and let Mike, uh, Mitch win. So um, I'm Michael Keating and you're not. I've always wanted to be able to say that. So what is the optimal approach to uh, CLL? And I'm going to argue for FCR or FR. So bendamustine is a bifunctional antineoplastic agent that really gained a tremendous amount of notoriety recently. And what I'd like to point out is that this agent was developed in 1971 in then East Germany and was subsequently used a great deal in German, in all of Germany when uh, the two Germanys united. One of the things I'd like to point out is that it's touted as a bifunctional molecule with what we have here as an alkylator group and a purine-like benzamolidyl ring. What it's, I think, important to appreciate is that what we see clinically is really just alkylator function. And I do believe that this molecule, instead of it being touted as sort of an FC in one, really is just an alkylator. And I think that's very important when we look for the long-term data. Because one of the things that we don't know, as Dr. Smith pointed out, is that we don't know long-term what happens when patients get bendamustine. And one of the questions that I'm sort of intrigued by is why we don't when this agent's been around since 1971. And so I think that this debate is going to evolve tremendously when we see what happens over time, but most importantly, keeping in mind that this is an alkylator agent nonetheless. And as a result, we would expect it to have the toxicities of all alkylating agents. The other thing to keep in mind is that we do see very significant T cell depletion with this agent. So CD4 counts can drop as low as they do with fludarabine based chemotherapy for up to two years. So I certainly believe that while this agent may look like a purine analog in combination with an alkylator agent, may behave only like an alkylator agent, we do see clinical sequelae that mimics both the alkylator as well as the um, purine analog section of the of the molecule. So first taking a look at fludarabine plus minus prednisone, and these are data from ancient history by our current standards, and you can see a median progression-free survival of 26 months with standard dose fludarabine. And this is really to set the stage of what we are looking at as our goal for the treatment of our patients. So fludarabine by itself, and then long-term outcome using the CLGB9712 study which was fludarabine plus rituximab, you could see the median progression-free survival for FR was 90.4 months. So significantly an improvement with the addition of rituxan and certainly some improvement with the addition of a decade in clinical experience. But let's look at bendamustine and its pivotal study in untreated CLL patients compared to chlorambucil. And what you can see here is that bendamustine had a median progression-free survival of only 21.6 months. So in what really was a very rigorously done modern-day clinical trial, the median progression-free survival of bendamustine by itself is actually shorter than fludarabine by itself, and far shorter than the combination of fludarabine plus rituxan. But so, and let's take a look a little bit further at these data. So the treatment regimen for this uh, clinical trial used 90 milligrams per meter squared days one and two, followed by, uh, with the addition of rituxan, 375 per meter squared cycle one, and 500 milligrams per meter squared cycles two through six. I'd like to point out that the dose of bendamustine is a moving target, where we really see patients get anywhere from 90 to 120 milligrams based upon the approval package. And yet we, and actually the 90, I, the caveat being that it's not really an approved dose, but it's what's become the standard in patients untreated getting combinations with rituxan. But in relapse disease, we see doses as low as 60 milligrams per meter squared used. So certainly the, the dose of bendamustine is a moving target. So the German CLL study group, CLL2M study, you looked at 117 patients with no age limit and this, of course, is an important caveat to all the subsequent discussions, with a median age of 64, though. And so while there's no age limit, they're certainly approaching what we typically see in the German CLL study group and in all the MD Anderson trials of FCR, 
which have median ages of about 61 to 62. And 73.5% of patients received all six cycles of bendamustine. And in the BR study, so remember the first thing I showed was bendamustine by itself with a 21.6 progression-free survival. Looking at what rituxan does now to bendamustine with a median progression-free survival of 33.9 months. So we had in fludarabine-based chemotherapy an improvement from 26 to, and I apologize, I forgot, <laughs> um, an improvement to 90.4 months. With bendamustine, you can see we have an improvement from 21.6 months to 33.9 months. So really, modern day first-line therapy rigorously done 33.9 months progression-free survival. And you can see very nice overall response rate here of 88%, but a CR rate of 23% and a PR rate of 63.9%. Looking at the adverse events from the CLL2M study, you could see here that there were a significant number of grade three or four toxicities, 26% uh, and 25% respectively for grade three and four, consisting mostly of cytopenias with a few other non-hematologic toxicities. I would like to point out that the infectious rate, which is probably gonna be the most important toxicity for our patients, given its result in morbidity and mortality, was 6.8%. And I do yield to Dr. Smith that this is a very low number for what we'll see with FCR. But looking at the German CLL study group, so the same group doing a different study, the CLL8 study, this study once again looked at FC versus FCR. So I'm really going to show you the data for both, but really speak to only the FCR data. And so there the dose was 25 milligrams per meter squared, days one through three, 250 milligrams per meter squared, days one through three, and then rituximab, 375 milligrams per meter squared, cycle one, followed by 500 milligrams per meter squared, cycles two through six. Once again, there is no um, age limit. The primary endpoint for both of these is progression-free survival. And 74% of all patients received all six courses of FCR chemotherapy. So looking at the CLL8 study, and here I have all the data up, but for comparison, we're gonna focus on just the FCR arm here. You can see their progression-free survival here of 51.8 months. So certainly less than what the um, CLGB study saw, but certainly a, a good comparator for the bendamustine plus rituxan study. Overall response rate, 95%, 44% CRs and an 87% overall survival at three years. And here you can see an update of that original data. So this is updated data from ASH 2012, now with a median follow-up of 5.9 years, with the median progression-free survival of 57 months. So improved over the earlier slide, which was the published data, we now have these data. Now, talking about the toxicities that were seen in the CLL8 study, we do see significantly more toxicity than what we saw with bendamustine plus rituxan in the CLL2M study, uh, with significantly more hematologic toxicities primarily. But once again, when we look at sort of the important ones, really neutropenia, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, anemia didn't really result in significant treatment morbidity or mortality outcome except for infectious risks which were significantly increased compared to what we would see with the bendamustine plus rituxan. But of course, when we look at that, the important question is gonna be who does better overall? And so while there is an increased risk of infections when we use FCR, we're trying to see you know, who does well longer. And a lot of these infections you know, might result in significant temporary morbidity but as long as they don't result in lasting mortality or lasting, I'm sorry, all, mortal, all mortality is lasting. But as long as it didn't result in any lasting morbidity or any mortality, we're still going to be doing okay for our patients. So looking at the overall response rate, you can see FCR does better than BR. By CR, it does better than um, bendamustine. And the progression-free survival of 57.33.9 months. So here we, sh we have data showing that by response and efficacy, 
FCR is better than BR. So the question ultimately becomes, why would you choose BR instead of FCR? All right, maybe it's because of toxicity. So I do yield on the infectious risks being increased with FCR. But once again, I'd like to emphasize that we don't see this have an impact on overall survival or on um, progression-free survival in terms of how patients are doing. Patients are still able to receive the therapy and most importantly, still able to derive the benefits of their therapy. And then looking at the patient comparison, which of course is always the important question, and that's one of the reasons why I used the CLL8 data instead of the MD Anderson data, was because the population that the patients were drawn from and the centers doing the studies were the same for both of these studies. But age over 65, the BR group had a higher percentage compared to FCR. Uh, the Binet stage uh, C patients, once again, BR had a higher percentage than FCR. IGVH and deletion 11Q were about the same. And then ZAP70 uh, was significantly higher in the FCR group than the uh, BR group. So in looking at these, certainly age over 65 and Binet stage C are important predictors of outcome. But in the modern era, ZAP70 really predicts is really the most important predictor out of all these that we looked at that were different between the two arms as to responses. So in looking at the FCR patients, one could argue that these patients were much more likely to not respond. And so there is the potential for a lot of patient selection bias into who you would put on a BR study versus an FCR study. So I'd like to also point out that that's a very important difference between these two populations. I'd also like to show MD Anderson's data, as I, I tend to always do, being director of the leukemia service there, or the director of the CLL service there. Um, so overall, looking at the uh, 300 patients from the NCI working group, we see an overall response rate of 95% with a CR rate of 72% and an early death rate of only 1%. And I think that's important, and that speaks to how well tolerable this regimen really is and how even though we do see an increase in adverse events, they don't result in the important endpoint of preventing people from benefiting from the therapy. And in looking at the progression-free survival, you can see here for the um, population here, it's a little bit longer than what we saw for the German CLL study group, but it certainly approaches the 84-month mark. I'd also like to point out that something we see on the FCR curve that we don't see on the Bendamustin curves is you see a very nice plateau. And I'd like to point out how many data points are on this plateau. So this isn't just a plateau because we don't have enough data points. And the question, of course, is as this plateau really begins almost at year 10, are we talking about curing all of these patients? So that's a very important thing to consider when we look at these different regimens because while both these agents are, toxic, are chemotherapy and both of them have their toxicities, if you can treat a patient, get them into remission, and have them not require further therapy, you're really doing them the best service possible. Um, and then, of course, by mutational status, you can see the same thing here with the Patients with good prognoses, really, it's very significant of them being cured, but even some with poor prognoses being cured. And so the tally, duration of follow-up, FCR, definitely. Overall response rate, FCR. CR rate, FCR. Progression-free survival, FCR. And on toxicity, I'm going to actually yield to my respective colleague. Thank you.